there and turn to the book of Matthew. If you're watching us online, you can do the same. We're so glad to have you with us. I want you to take out your bulletin uh, referenced earlier, lots that's happening. We trust you're reading these things. Uh, keep us from doing a lot of announcements in our services, but there's also a, a QR code that takes you to a um, sermon response guide that is yours. Great work and a lot of time has been uh, put into the response guide where you can take it and dive deeper into this message throughout the coming week. Because we're here not simply to attend church or hear a teaching, but to actually make disciples, to be daily disciples walking with Jesus. I want to start with, uh, with a question. Let me ask you this. What, what does it feel like uh, to be wrong? Think about that for a minute. Uh, words that you might... Uh, used to describe what it feels like to be wrong. You might say, well, it feels, it's embarrassing. You know, we don't like to be wrong, do we? It's, um, it's shameful, maybe. It's dreadful. It's, it's kind of hard to take. I feel kind of ignorant. I thought I knew something. Now, let me rephrase the question. What does it feel like to realize that you're wrong? Because you see, feeling, the feeling of being wrong is, it does feel like something. It feels like being right. You you tracking with me? Being wrong feels exactly like being right until you realize that you're wrong. And the Bible tells us that you and I are wrong a lot more often than we know. In fact, in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, you might know this verse, there is a way that seems right to a man or woman, boy or girl, but its end is the way of death. The intriguing thing about this verse is not that it leads to death, but that it seems so right. I am fascinated these days, maybe like you, watching the courageous leadership of Ukraine's president, Zelensky, who defiantly is coming at Putin, even as the Russian uh, army starts to surround Kiev. When do we start calling it Kiev instead of Kiev, by the way? I just, I just don't know. But uh, it, is, it is so hard to watch. Uh, and so grateful that our church is actually, we, if you're like me, you're watching it going, we got to do something. We can do something. We got to stop this. And, and we can do something. We can pray. We've said you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. You can pray, but we can do more than pray. So our, our church, because of your giving, particularly to our, our disaster relief fund, we're able to send resources. We have people who are literally on the ground in Ukraine and in the uh, bordering countries who are serving the refugees. I say all this, it's so hard to watch. But what's happening, what's fascinating to me in this age of, of real-time news and internet and social media, though Russia has shut down just this week, shut down their broader access to, to the internet, um, President Zelensky continues to come on on social media, on Instagram, other places, in the moment, sending out all day long, here's what's going on, here's what I've done, here's what's happening, we're going to win this thing, glory to Ukraine, here's what's happening, here's what's happening. And what he's doing, as much as there is a war on the ground and coming with missiles from the air and bombs, he is in a war against the false narrative that's being played out by Putin. And it's propaganda, right? We know that in Russia, they're able to watch state news, propaganda news. uh, And very few now have access to Western sources of news, which they did formerly. Now, there's, I understand, an app or there's a news source, Telegraph. And and like here in America, younger people don't watch state news there. Young people here don't get their news from network news. You know this, right? It's, it's It's online. I mean, it's where I get primary, most of my news. It, it's, it's online and you can get various sources and, and, and not so, so biased and such. And even there in Russia, the younger crowd still having access to Western news is seeing a very different story played out where others are thinking this is a special military operation instead of an all-out war. My point is this. Putin's war is a war against truth. Zelensky knows that if he's to win this war, it's going to be winning the war of truth over lies. You and I 
living in our lives today are in the same battle on a spiritual level. Because Satan is coming at us constantly with his disinformation campaign. He's the slanderer. He is the liar. And he is coming at us constantly. The battle over sin in our lives starts in the mind and it is a battle over truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and what? The truth shall set you free. Free from what? Free from bondage. Free from the bondage of sin. When we know truth, we're able to fight against the lies of the evil one. And so today in Matthew chapter 3, turn to chapter 3, chapter Three and four, we're going to look at what we're calling the coronation of the king. Uh, Last week, we looked at the genealogy of Jesus, just to place this in context for a moment. The word genesis is the word genealogy in in, in the Greek. Uh, You can hear the word. The word is genesis. At the beginning of Matthew, he says, here's the genesis. Here's the origin of Jesus. What he's doing, any, any first century Hebrew reading this, hearing him, would have known Oh my gosh, this is a new beginning. This is like the origin again. This is the book of Genesis all over again. Here comes now the new Adam. Here comes Jesus who is the fulfillment of all the prophecies. And so he lays out the genealogy. We we said that Jesus is the king of superstars. He's the king of outsiders. He's the king of failures. And he's the king of nobodies. They're all in his genealogy. And we all find our place there. So then in in chapter uh, two, it moves on to the, really chapter one into two, the the Christmas story. We've got that. And then you know the story of Herod then trying to take out all the the baby boys to and under because he hears of this king who has been born by some who, who get the word to him. And he's trying to now take out the King Jesus. The Holy Family leaves, goes to Nazareth where Jesus then is raised and then we were catapulted 30 years and John the Baptist shows up on the scene like a bull in a china shop with his crazy diet and crazy uh, attire. He then is there in chapter three. I want you to look at chapter three, verse five. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, to John the Baptist. And they were They were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, you may not know that there was baptism, I suppose you do, baptism before Jesus came along. You would say, well, what was this baptism for? Well, well, John is very clear. It's baptism for repentance of sin. And it was that, but it goes way back to uh, Leviticus even, where baptism was a ritual cleansing that you had to, to accomplish before you would sacrifice at the temple. So baptism was a way of, of saying, not unlike us, I just came from a, bab- I just baptized in the great hall today. And, and what, what a lot of us miss is that the water, yes, we understand water is this universal cleansing, right? I'm, I'm washed, I'm being cleansed, and all of me is being cleansed, all right, immersion. And I'm raised up. What we forget, though, is that it's actually a watery grave. We're dying to ourselves. We're raised up, totally forgiven, now to live a new life. What is this life? A life victorious now. And so Jesus comes. You might say, why is he being baptized? Jesus doesn't, he's not repenting of sin. He doesn't, he's not doing this. But, but, but you might know that in John, in the book of John, uh, John 1 the gospel writer says that John said in this moment, as Jesus arrives, he says, behold, do you know what he said? The lamb of God who what? Takes away the sin of the world. This is who's coming right now. Now think about this. Then Jesus enters into this ritual of cleansing that you must go through in order to sacrifice at the temple. Jesus, no sin. However, he walks through this ritual uh, in, 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 that's in the law, all the way back to Leviticus, that he walks through, and he will ultimately become the sacrifice himself. Offer himself as the perfect lamb of God, sacrifice, he offers himself. But there's much more going on here. He's also showing us the very life he's going to live, and ultimately the very death he's going to die and be raised again. And he also 
gives us the example for us to imitate because we identify with him by being baptized when we say, I too have died to myself. You see, this is a submission to the Father is what's happening here. And when we are baptized, we we offer ourselves in submission, dying to self, totally forgiven, raised up to live a new life. Now, that's already happened in our hearts. It's why we call it believer's baptism. Only believers are baptized. Those who have received his grace have decided to die and no longer live for themselves, but live for Jesus. And and so I, I would pause right here. This is just setting up the entire message, really. Pause here. If you've not been baptized and you're a believer, you need to be baptized. Every person who identifies with Jesus needs to be baptized. And I would love to talk to you about that after this service. This is a foretelling of the life of Jesus, but it's an act of submission. It is a a picture of the cruciform life, the cross-shaped life that we're all called to live now. This sets up the rest of this passage. Look at what it says in verse 16. Verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, well, let me back up. No, go back to verse 15. Back to verse 15. So Jesus, so they, you, can, you can imagine why John then banters back and forth a bit. I should be baptized by you. In verse 15 he says, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Jesus is saying he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And he says, I'm gonna do this and he's showing us now the example for us to follow. Now verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I want you to see this fascinating, the Trinity on full display in two verses. So we have the spirit descending like a dove on the son the father speaks now we have Jesus announced as the son of God this is in essence his coronation you know which is a ceremony when one becomes king now he's always been king in eternity past and eternity future but this is now the the father proclaiming to the world this is who he is He's the beloved. Now notice that it's before he preaches any sermon, before he does anything, before miracle one. His identity is fixed by the Father. I want you to see that this is so important. This is true for each of us. If you're in Christ, you you need to remember this today because it sets up now as we move to the temptations. If you are in Christ, here it is, your identity is received, not achieved. Your identity is given to you by God. You are forgiven. You're totally loved, fully accepted. You are victorious now in Christ. This is who we are. Are you aware that you can live a victorious life? I don't know if you knew this, but when you got saved, if you have received Christ like me, I didn't know I was enlisting in an army. I was enlisting into a war. Because what happens is Jesus is baptized and then immediately he enters into the battle, which is a picture of his entire life. And it's ours as well. We've said it this way. Friends, you and I live in occupied space. We forget that there is a spiritual realm around us all the time. And we need to remember that we're in a battle, but we're victorious in Christ. Have you seen how many, uh, how many young men and actually men and women from all over the world wanting to volunteer for the Ukrainian army? Have you seen this? Why? For freedom to be set free and not under the slavery of Russia. So, so we see in Galatians 5, 1, Paul says this, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, the yoke of the law, the yoke of religion, the yoke of sin. Now, now I, I know this because I've always read that thinking, for freedom, he set us free. Well, that's, of course, that's kind of redundant. We're free to live in freedom. But I think sometimes we forget that. 
You have been forgiven so that you can live victoriously. See, some of us today need to make a declaration. We need to declare that we are going to live victorious lives. Here's what I want to ask you. Are you truly, truly committed to holiness in your life? Is your commitment to live just like Jesus? And what I want to do today as we enter into thinking about the temptations of Jesus and how they apply to us, I want you to see that every attack comes at the very point of your identity first. Satan will start to have you question. He'll have you question who you really are now in Christ. Satan attacks your identity and then he moves from there. We've always known his tactics. And this is what I want you to see today. 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan for we are not ignorant of his designs. Friends, we know his schemes. He's got a pattern. He doesn't want me to preach this message because we're going to reveal how he works and we're going to live victoriously this week. Many of you are going to overcome sin that has gripped you for so long. Some of you are in habitual sin and you think, well, I'm, I'm just going to, I guess this is my life. No, it's not. You can live victoriously. Look at, at chapter four, verse one. Here we go. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit. We've noted this recently. Interestingly, the spirit leads him into the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now that's the, an understatement, uh, but he is fully man. He's declared fully God, the son of God. And now he's, he's fully man led into the Eremos, into the wilderness, into the solitude. This would be a pattern of his life. Intense times before God in prayer, reminding him who he is, his identity, running back to who he is before the father. And then inten intense times of ministry, intense times of prayer, intense times in the world, serving the Lord in the battle. Does that mark your life? Is that rhythm a part of your life? Could you show that your, your life is in the same rhythm? Intense times alone with God in prayer, in his word, being centered, reminded of who you are, and then out serving him every single day in the battle. Friends, you can't stay in the battle long if you don't retreat and be reminded of who you are in him. Three things I want you to see here today. The temptations center around Satan challenging us, challenging Jesus here, and we'll, we'll apply for, for, uh, on three, three points. That, that, uh, the one is questioning God's provision, and then the second one is questioning God's protection, and then the third is questioning God's power in our lives. First, God's provision. Satan wants us to, to question whether or not God will provide for us. Look at verse three. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now look at this. The last thing Jesus heard in chapter three, verse 17 was what? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The next thing he hears, don't miss this. The next thing he hears is if you are the son of God. Really? If you are, you see, he's questioning his identity. And, the, and, and again, this is how Satan tempts us. If you really are a Christian, would you be living like this? Really? I've talked to so many people. I mean, through my youth ministry days and, and even in adult ministry and as a pastor who start to question their salvation. If I was a Christian, would I really be thinking this? Would I still be struggling with this sin? If I was a Christian, why isn't God blessing me in the ways that I want to be blessed? We, we question our identity. I feel alone. I, I, I feel alone. Am I really, does God really love me? We even have dissatisfaction and we're discouraged oftentimes. And so we try then to, we succumb to temptation is God going to really provide for me or not? We often make, we want to take shortcuts. That's really what this temptation is. We, we, want, to, we, want, to, we want to take shortcuts and, and satisfy ourselves. See, so often this temptation is a function of timing. I mean, lust would fall under this temptation. Is God going to provide for me or do I need to take it 
for myself in some unrighteous way. That which is not righteously mine, will I go ahead and take it? And this happens for all of us in varying ways. You feeling down? You're not feeling whole, feeling loved today? Well, well, go ahead and, hey, drink a little something. That'll help. That'll help. Medicate the pain. That you, you can do that now. Do that. Go shopping. That might make you feel better. Maybe you need to eat more. That would help. Isn't that what happens? We all succumb to this kind of temptation. In the end, we've got to understand God is going to provide for us. He is our provider. When we question God's ability to provide, we start to move on, on our own, and, 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 it, and it brings about all kinds of problems in our lives, in, in our marriages, in our families. And we need to understand that God will provide for us. We gotta trust in him. This is the first temptation. Because we know this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you that's common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide, there it is, provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Friends, don't miss this. This week, as you're tempted, maybe with the same temptations that you get all the time, there's a way out. There's always a way out. And he's always leading us to something better. He will provide something even better. Look at verse four. Verse four, he says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now don't miss this. This is central to the message. Jesus responds to the temptation. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Listen, friends, you can't say it is written if you're not reading the word of God. If you're not in the word, you can't, you can't come at Satan with the truth. And he wins this battle of disinformation in your heart and in your life. You forget who you are. You, you forget your identity. You forget the gospel, that you're totally loved, fully forgiven, that you're victorious in Christ. You forget all of this and you succumb thinking, well, I just don't have the power to overcome this. Here I go again. And oftentimes we enter into the temptation thinking the next step is, well, temptation, sin. I'm about to sin. No. It even says the spirit leads us. James tells us God actually leads us into points of temptation. Now he says, God doesn't tempt anyone because he doesn't sin, but he does allow us into situations. Why? Not to be deceived by the evil one or to fall into sin, but to be victorious and to grow in him. Temptation is an opportunity to step up and say, I know the truth about this situation. This will not provide for me. God will provide for me and I must trust in him. You see, so many of us, we, we, we fall into the news of this world and here's a challenge for some of us. This is a real practical challenge for us over the next, not even 40 days now, towards Easter. I'm going to challenge you with this. There's a lot of ways during the Lent, Lenten season to fast. Here's one simple way for some of you. Before you listen to any news in the morning, before you look at your phone, before you read the paper, before you turn on the television, before you look at the internet, whatever you're looking at, before you look at what's going on in the world, the news that's coming at us, to enter your mind and your heart into the good news of the gospel and the word of God. Friends, every day in my life, I start with the truth of God's word. And in the mornings even, Lord, remind me again, Remind me again of who I am. It's a little prayer. I pray all the time going into worship uh, throughout the day. Lord, remind me again. Remind me again. We're so prone to forget, friends, because every temptation that you will fall to is first an attack on your identity. And then next, it's a challenge for you to believe whether God will provide for you or not. We can win this thing. God gives us victory over sin. The first one is questioning his provision. The next one is, is questioning God's protection. Look at verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now some have said, did this really happen? Was this a vision? Either way, in the moment. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Now wait, so now Satan's quoting scripture. Out of context, by the way, this is important to note. 
Satan quotes scripture totally out of context, constantly he's twisting God's word. He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Here's the temptation. God will not protect me. I have to protect myself. I must protect myself. This is what causes us to build walls around ourselves. We're challenged. I've got to protect my ego, my reputation, my relationships. I can't share what's really going on. I've got to protect myself, and that causes us to enter into greater and greater sin. Some of us need to get in a, in a connect group here in our church. And the reason many of us are, 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 are slow to do that, we're trying to protect ourselves. I don't know if I want to get that close to people. Friends, you cannot live this life. You cannot live the Christian life apart from community. Being in life and, and, and love with Jesus together. And, and know this, whatever you're anxious about, whatever you fear losing, will point you to your idols. We've said it before, your deepest emotions point you to your idols. What makes you worry? What makes you anxious? If you can name those things, even in the moment, it points to your idols. Another way to say it, the the things that worry you the most are the places where you trust God the least. I want you to think about that. And by the way, you can be writing some of these things down. They're going to help you this week. We've got a place for you to write these things down. Now look at verse 7. Jesus said to him, again, it is written. There it is again. It is written. It is written. It is written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Have you ever thought about this? How did Jesus know scripture like this? You think, well, he's the son of God. He knows scripture. He knows it all. No, 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 no. Fully God, fully man. Luke tells us that he grew in wisdom and stature. Jesus studied the word of God. He learned it over time. As a teenager, as a young man, he learned the scriptures as a boy. And we do the same. What what is going on here? You must not put the Lord God. What does he mean by this? How do we put God to the test? Here it is. This is asking God to prove himself faithful before we'll trust him. That's what's happening here. And we do the same. But friends, let me ask you, in the safety of this place, right? It's easy to answer. Has God not already proven himself faithful? Yes, yes, and yes. Over and over again, you can trust him. You don't have to protect yourself. He protects us. His provision can be trusted. His protection and finally God's power. When I question God's power, I start to doubt that he will will accomplish what needs to be accomplished in my life. This includes his sovereignty over my life. I question his power. Look at verse eight. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now it begs the question, does Satan really own all things? I mean, can he even offer what he's challenging Jesus with? Now in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says he's the God of this world. In, in, in uh, Ephesians 2, 2, it says he's the prince. Satan's the prince of this world. Watch this. Satan might be prince. Jesus is king. God owns everything. He, you could say he owns Satan. Satan does nothing apart from God allowing him the freedom to do so. And, and so Satan has no power over Jesus. He's got nothing to give Jesus. And listen, he's got nothing to give you. Satan has nothing for us that we need. Look at verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Be gone. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Watch this. The father provides what he needed all along. But but I want you to see this. In what area of your life do you, here's an application as we close. In what area of your life do you need to say, be gone, Satan? Not today. You, you, you need to say this this week or in the moment when, you, when you're tempted to sin or, oh, they just cut me off in traffic. Oh, I'm going to say this. Not today, Satan. I was in the hospital room not too long ago with one of our members who was struggling. I mean, had moments near death, a couple of near death moments. And, and I was in the hospital and he said, Jeff, it has been so dark in here in my life 
And there have been many times I've said, Satan, get out of this room. Leave. Leave me. Whatever demonic forces and darkness are in this place that I'm feeling that are beating me down, get out of here. And I don't know if you, if you think that's weird or some kind of exorcism or something. Listen, every single one of us need to learn to pray this kind of prayer. Not today, Satan. Not in my life. We have victor- victory over him. We can live victorious lives. Tony Evans was here speaking to a group of men not too long ago. Well, several years ago now, I guess, pandemic. That's like dog years. But it was pre-pandemic. And, and, and Tony Evans said, I want to wake up in the morning. And when I put my feet on the floor, I want Satan to say, uh-oh, he's awake. <laughs> right? Listen, uh-oh, here she comes. Uh-oh, here he comes. Listen, friends, you are a spiritual force in this world to overcome sin, not to fall into it. My challenge for us today is that you can trust God with his provision. You can trust him with his protection and you can trust his power in your life. And let me ask you this. Does your love for him outweigh your desire for even being good? Do you love his word? Do you treasure it? Do you want more of it? Your time in his word will answer that question. Your time in his word, because you can't say it is written if you don't know his word. And no wonder you're being defeated by the evil one. You need to capture verses that apply to particular sins that you're struggling with. You can do that. You can Google. You can find all these things nowadays and say, I'm going I'm to quote this at, in my life. I'm going to learn this passage right here. I'm going to learn this first. I'm going to put it on my mirror. I'm going to put it in my car. I'm going to put it in that place where I'm most tempted. And I am going to remember God's word. Because listen, you are being challenged with a disinformation campaign. And the evil one is sifting many of us like wheat. And he's calling us to live victorious lives. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, it says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, we have a high priest who sympathizes with us. He's been tempted in every way, yet without sin. He walks with us. We can abide in him. And look at what it says in Hebrews 4, 16. I'm going to jump to 16 to to close us out. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friends, you have the spirit of God with you this week. Jesus walking alongside us as we abide in him. Will you fall to the lies of the evil one this week? Or will you trust in the truth of God's word? Will you respond? It is written. I already know what I believe. I will not fall to the temptations of the evil one. Friends, remember, he will provide for you all that you need in the moment. He will protect you. And his power is more than enough for you to overcome sin in your life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word today. We we know that the evil one is constantly trying to distract us, to send our minds off to that which is not true. And Lord, even as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and for the people there, we pray for a turn. We pray for truth to prevail. Even among the Russian people, we pray for truth to prevail. But Lord, I pray as we leave this place and and go into the afternoon as lies come at us throughout this week in our minds, I pray for every person here, myself included, that we will live the truth. We'll live it out that you are God, that you're faithful. And Lord, we love you. We give our lives to you anew. So now go and live victoriously in your name, we pray. Amen.